This show is sponsored by the National Association for Primary Education. Hello, my name is Mark Taylor and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place for creative and inspiring learning from around the world. Listen to teachers, parents and mentors share how they are supporting children to live their best authentic life and are proving to be a guiding light to us all. Hello, I hope you are safe and well. Thank you so much for joining us. Today I'm going to be chatting to Drew Clavell about her book, World Class, One Mother's Journey Halfway Around the Globe in Search of the Best Education for Her Children. And this chronicles her experience of over a decade raising her children in the local public schools of Hong Kong, Shanghai, Tokyo and California. And then her return journey with her family back to her hometown of New York City in 2018. Taru earned a master's degree in global and international education and a bachelor's degree in Asian studies. She's been featured on shows such as the Today Show, CBS This Morning, as well as Channel News Asia, not to mention being on over 2,500 radio shows, as well as being featured in places like the Japanese Times, the Financial Times, and being on nationally syndicated radio shows and podcasts to, to millions of listeners. This is a really interesting conversation about her experiences and how the different systems work from around the world, but also a bit of insight into her background and and her educational experiences and how that's really given her a perspective of what she wants best for her children. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. This is Taru Clavel talking about her book, World Class. Hi, Taru. Thanks for joining me and let's explore the journey of who you are. So nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about where, where you're living in the world. What's kind of thing that you're into and exactly um, what it is that you want to be able to share with us today? Well, right now I'm in, in New York City and I have, have just recently come out with a book. It's called World Class and it explores my journey from 2006 through 2018, having raised my three children in the local public schools of Hong Kong, Shanghai, Tokyo, and then Palo Alto, California. And it's half anecdotal and half research. And it's uh, and I wrote it hoping to empower parents and educators to be able to make educational decisions for their children. And what are some of the key things that you, you came across there? I mean, I, I'm, this is such an important thing for everybody, but certainly something very close to my heart in terms of the work that I do with an education and also as a parent of three children as well. What are some of the, the key things that you've sort of discovered through that journey? Well, there were so many, so many different areas. But and, I, and people ask me this question all the time. If you had to say one thing, what would it be, <laughs> you know, to sum, summarize 12 years of learning? But I, I would give you a few pieces. Um, in the first one, people love talking about, it's that where we came from, there was no technology in the classrooms. And when I returned to the United States in 2016, at that point, I had two kids in primary school and one in middle school. And there was technology everywhere. And everybody was given a computer or an iPad. And it was really confusing for me because I felt like suddenly these kids had unfiltered, kind of unmonitored access to all kinds of content that could be very inappropriate. Um, And in my mind, rose uh, all kinds of disciplinary and anxiety issues as well. So the first thing is, I would say, you know, let's take a good look at the use of technology in our homes and our classrooms and make sure we are very intentional about the outcomes that it produces. Otherwise, let's get rid of it. Um, That would be a first thing. Um, And the second thing I would say is the notion and the importance of community that I observed in the classroom and then the larger society in Japan is, is, is quite unique. And kids in Japan are autonomous or very independent by the time they're six years old. They're going to and from school on their own and after school activities. And it could be the local school that's, you know, a five or 10 minute walk, or it could be a, a school that's further away that requires lots of public transportation, including a bus and train and walking. And if anybody's seen those videos or been a part of rush hour traffic, uh, subway traffic during Japan, I mean, you could literally be elevated. The the trains are so packed. And kids do that all on their own. And the, the reason they can do that is because there is so much value placed on the community. And how that's done is within the classrooms, Kids have to take care of their their physical space and one another. 
starting in first grade. So that means they don't have janitors or cafeteria staff and they're cleaning toilets and the floors and their desks and the chalkboards. And what it does is it shows them that they're part of something bigger than than just taking care of themselves, which then lends itself to how they behave in the wider community. And then it became becomes a very very kind of a safe, nurturing environment where everybody is looking out for everyone else. Um, so I would say that's something that we can all take a page from because I think it's rare to see, especially these days, communities that are really looking out for one another. Um, I mean, I live in New York, but and I'm and I'm definitely guilty of this. It's when you look around and you're on public transportation or walking down the street, and people are immersed in their in their technology. You know, and they don't even look around at where they are. And I was gobsmacked at myself when, for instance, I don't know, in the last year or so, I was sitting in the subway and I was looking at my iPhone, probably doing work or something like that. And I look up and there's this elderly gentleman standing there. And I thought, what happened to me? I'm not even looking around to offer my seat to this man. And I felt, you know, I felt quite ashamed. But I think these days our kids are just used to that. They're not, they're not even looking around, you know, the whole, you know, stop and smell the roses. Well, we're not even looking around, period. I think that's really true. And, 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 and what I love about that community aspect and, and, and the kind of taking care of yourself and others around you is it's, it's such an important part of where to start, isn't it? I mean, certainly here in the UK, and I think it's the same in the States as well, you know, it's kind of get into school and now we need to be thinking about English and maths and learning. And and all of that is incredibly important. But, it, you know, the, the starting point of just actually who are we? You know, where do we fit in our surroundings? How do we re- relate and interact with people around us? That's a much more sensible and natural and organic place for us to actually begin as, as young people that then gives us the skills and the understanding to put all those other levels of education above that. Yeah, I think that would be a little more kind of going back to maybe a previous generation when we did better take care of our neighbors. Um, in the U.S., you know, there's stories of when a family sees kids on their own rather than saying, hey, you know, we want to come over, um, hang out with, with our family. Instead, they'll call the police, you know, and, and parents will get into trouble. And so it's it's just a very different model. Um, something else that I think is really important that I witnessed both in, in my kids' uh, schools in Shanghai and in Japan is also this high level of expectation. And I'm not saying we don't have it in other parts of our lives or in other countries, but in Shanghai, if my son didn't get, and this is an elementary school, if he didn't get a 95% on his quiz or an assignment, he stayed after school until as long as it took for him to master that content. And the teacher was there and some kids would stay through dinner. And that was a that was pretty mar- marvelous because in the U.S. when this first started happening, my whole because I was educated mostly in the U.S., my whole understanding of it was, oh, he must be a discipline case. There must be a behavioral problem, not that there was this extra work to be done to help my child. And in Japan too, it was you know, and it's very classroom and teacher based. But in Japan, it was about an 80 or 85 percent was required until kind of more supports were put into place. And I am not quite sure what it's like in the UK, and it probably is more teacher based. But in the US, it's very common that if a kid isn't basically failing, you know, all the the supports aren't going to be put in, and even when they are, they're not they're not put into place. And it's not just the teacher, but There are all kinds of um, systems in the classrooms where they will have two desks next to one another and the pairing is very, very intentional. So it's the the stronger student in one subject placed next to, seated next to a student who may be a little bit weaker and those students who may need a little more help sit at the front of the classroom and, um, you know, they're paraprofessionals and and teachers that come in for, for students who need additional help. And it's interesting because I feel like in the United States, at least, those children may get labeled somehow um, as those who can't perform or, you know, in some cases, behaviorally, maybe they're the naughty children and they and they need more behavioral support. But, you know, it's just kind of par for the course in these classrooms overseas. And some kids need more help at other times and, and some kids don't. And they ebb and flow at different times in their development. So it could be, you know, first grade versus third grade or week one versus week five. And I think a great takeaway for 
parents is within our homes, we have to set expectations and have conversations with our children about what do we consider an educated person? Does that mean in school you have to get a 95% if the teacher doesn't have that high standard? Or does it mean it's an 80%? Or is that too you know, subjective so it doesn't matter? The parent will look at the work. Does it mean that they're spending a lot of time playing soccer or chess or karate or doing household chores? So it's it's coming up with those, with those household values if they're not being instilled in the classroom. Yeah, I really love that. And I was chatting to um, Mike Buchanan from the International Positive Education Network, and he was talking about that exactly the same thing that essence of you know what is an educated person you know and and we talked about the fact that you know the the traditional education academic side of it of course is very important but that um environment of being exposed to to physical education and music and drama and the arts and immersing yourself into various different things and like you said the progress changes you know from a year one to a year three or it might be that you're very easily adaptable to something in a particular subject but another one you need a bit more support with and I think when everyone's accepting of where they are at any given time then like you say all those stigmas and all those things that you may get in some sort of certainly some more sort of western classrooms just sort of dis- disappear because it's then just about you and your progression and like you say your values within your household and then from there hopefully you've got that sort of sense of self where you're just progressing and learning in a way that you feel comfortable with that you know is actually for your own benefit. I think that's right but I also think we do have to have high standards and you know th- there comes a point where you do have to have these intentional interventions Um, and, and it, which is fine. You know, that's where the stigma shouldn't be, shouldn't, shouldn't come into play. It's just, okay, so we need a little help here and a little more help in somewhere else. And something that's also important that that's a, that's a corollary to this is our kids today are being, I guess, and it's really our parents and educators fault criticized for not having a sense of resilience and, you know, is, is parents and educators there is this trend and I talk about this too in my book world class and this is a bit controversial as well but we give our kids so many tries you know there's this whole mastery based learning where a a child who may not perform well on an assignment can retake redo the assignment numerous times and while the scaffolding there is important there has to come a time when the child is accountable for what he or she produces on that first take. And what we're also doing at the same time is we're not letting our kids fail, you know? And if we don't let our kids fail, which life is full of failures, right? And if we don't let our kids do it when they're starting out, when they're, when they're young and building that resiliency and figuring out what tools they need to overcome those challenges, they're not going to have them when they're adults. And that's why we, all, we we see right now, you know, this whole failure to launch when kids leave for university or leave the home when they're 18 or post-university. And we, I, I would love for us to all kind of rethink this, you know, let's let it matter the first time and let's not be there to swoop in and pick up our kids every time they fall because otherwise they, all they really learn is that mom or dad or caregiver, guardian or teacher can just come in and fix the problem. And in reality you know, that's not really going to happen in real life. So it'll better prepare, I think, our kids for the real world if we if we kind of go back a little bit more and do kind of old school, okay, here's the assignment and here's your grade. And then we move on from here because there are plenty of studies that show when you fail, you learn even more from your mistakes. Uh, that's I think that's absolutely true and and I think like you said you know when you realize that your perception of what the word fail means changes to to, it's actually a learning experience you know and like you say it may well be that in order to get that better grade the first time round, you just need to do it differently or you need to be prepared in a different way or it's just something you didn't actually understand and like you said then then those conversations start to go how how does that work in the future how do I progress how do I you know move forward in both my emotional self and my understanding of what it felt to fail in inverted commas whatever that happened to be in that particular way and and how how do I move on in the future and and I think like I say 
I think a lot of it is just that emotional understanding of what it means to you as part of that growing process. And I think you're right. I think sort of it, well, it's it's really the system that wants it to be a certain way, like I said, and that scaffolding idea that will just make sure that it it looks a certain way. And certainly here in the UK, part of that is the fact that the schools in terms of getting their funding and wanting to be attractive to um, parents to bring their kids to that particular school, you know, they want to have great results. And in order to get great results, then it has to look a certain way however you get there. And, uh, and I, like you say, it perpetuates the sort of thing that you were, you were describing before. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what does your life look like now and how is it different from when you were growing up? You know, it's so fun. I think about this quite a bit because you hear, you know, generation after generation, oh, things are more complicated. It's so hard now. This generation is so messed up. And and it's funny because, you know, I remember being a kid and hearing, you know, my parents' generation saying that about my generation. And and I think, oh, my gosh, it's so complicated now. These kids have too, tech- too much technology and look at where the world is going with so much, you know, politically. And, and so how is it different? I mean, in that way, it's probably the same. Um, but I would say that I am, I am, I am nervous about this generation, and mostly because of all the things you know I just mentioned, and why I wanted to write the book World Class because I feel like what was working so well is kind of not happening anymore. You know, the whole pencil to paper learning and kids reading from books and having that relationship with books and retaining that information and having higher reading comprehension skills and and knowing what grammar is to be able to write better and being strong mathematicians and scientists because they've mastered their basic arithmetic. And that kind of stuff is, is kind of fallen away. And I can say in the U.S., and I don't want to get into too much of a political conversation here, but I do worry about the ability for democracy to to sustain itself when we're becoming so much more partisan in our in our beliefs and so staunchly so that i mean you know friendships are broken families are being broken apart and it it, it and i wonder and i'm fearful for what our children are seeing being raised in this kind of an environment when at least in the united states Teachers and schools are very nervous about having conversations about what's going on in the real world in their classrooms because of, you know, parent objections in terms of teaching values when we're supposed to be valuing um, everybody's opinions and maybe teachers aren't necessarily prepared or trained to have those conversations in the classroom. So I, I guess it's, and I'm talking maybe a little bit in circles here, but you know, I think back and it's, you know, when I was in school, I always wondered, you know, what does any of this mean? Like, why am I studying earth science or, or why am I reading whatever maybe book I was reading at the time that didn't really resonate with me? Um, and, and, and I wanted more real world learning and I'm fearful that our kids may feel similarly when so much of what they're learning is in a vacuum and we're not doing that good a job of preparing them for what's going on outside of the classrooms. Yeah, it's a really interesting point that, and um, we're going to come on to, in a minute to, in terms of the teachers you remember and why, but um, one, one of the answers we hear and talk about a lot about that is actually lots of the people that actually are able to put the things that they're teaching and and the learning that's going on in the classroom related to that kind of real world and in the now and how these things actually relate and I think it is it's a very interesting thing that and I mean certainly here in the UK with the many years now of going through Brexit in the and like you said before about democracy and certainly here in the in Parliament, you know, democracy isn't working in the way that many people think that it should and because like you say, you've got the party political system and how that's been really polarized because of all these things. And and you're right, it's a very interesting time historically, but also it, it does bring lots of issues with it as well. And uh and it, I think you're right. I think that those overall value things that we can talk about I think are important for everybody as they're as they're growing up and it shouldn't be shied away from um but like I say it needs to be dealt with very sensitively as as we go through these modern times times. Well, see, and that's another thing that you bring up, the foundation, you know, the principles of a democracy being is being able to respect, hear, and debate the other side. And when we don't demonstrate that in the classroom, and certainly not in, in greater society, when it becomes too contentious and, 
and frankly, even physically violent at this point, you know, what, what are our kids seeing? Right. I mean, do they think this is acceptable? How are they going to be, how are they going to be, um, you know, effectively and happily living in, in a democracy? These are questions that I think about quite a bit. Yeah, and I think, like I say, when when you sort of discuss those things in the whole as part of everything, then it, I think it, it gives everyone a clearer picture in, in terms of of why you study certain things, doesn't it? And all, like you said before about the grammar and the reading, you know, how you articulate it, what it's based on, all that understanding, and then it's got that real real purpose. Yeah. What did what did you find valuable about your own school experience? And and we we spoke just a moment ago there about the teachers that you may well have remembered and and what it was about them that had such an impact. Well, this is an inter- this it's an interesting question. Um, and a lot of school, frankly, and this is probably why I am now in education and write <laughs> about education, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. It really felt like I was learning these subjects that weren't relevant to my upbringing. I was raised by a single immigrant mom. I'm an only child. And we spoke Japanese in my home. And my home was quite culturally Japanese. And actually, I, I in, in my book, World Class, I talk about how so much of what I learned about U.S. culture came from, from media. As a result, I titled every chapter in my book after TV shows from the 60s or 70s or <laughs> 80s, actually. So I have, you know, The Twilight Zone or Mission Impossible. And when we first moved to Hong Kong, I call that chapter Gilligan's Island, you know, stranded on an island with a strange cast of characters kind of a thing. Um, You know, so I had this very different home where home life or I think in, in which in my grade, I think I was the only one who didn't speak English at home. And and then I would go to school and it just felt like a completely different universe that wasn't related to anything that I was experiencing outside. And I, in schools are, are working very hard to work on diversity and inclusion. Um, but that, that really, really struck me. And, and it struck me all through, through senior year of high school. So to me, and I talk about this in world class, and this is why I am in education, because I don't want kids to have the same interpretation of education that I had, which is education to me felt like a game to be played. And I made it through to the Ivy League. And what a shame. You know, I I felt like I should have been going to school every day, relishing the experience and appreciating the privilege of being able to feed my brain every day. And instead, I just couldn't wait to be 18 and get out of the house and get on my own two feet and, and get out of the system, basically, which wasn't really until I was 22. But that was that was really unfortunate for me, I feel like. And it's interesting, isn't it, sort of looking back on those things. And I, and I think you've articulated that perfectly. It is a game and everyone sees it as a game. And, and when they're not, when you're not engaged in school and you're wanting to get through the system and or get out of the school at the end of the day or looking to the, sort of the future too much, it takes you out of the now. And it, and, and, and that, that game that everyone is sort of learning to play has very little to do with learning and it has very little to do with education and it certainly doesn't help us in terms of learning through our whole life. And um, it's interesting that you sort of having experienced it and done it and then now gone back in and been able to then... Sh- bring those ideas and understanding to to people that can really make a difference in the people going through the system now. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I think about with my own children all the time, because I assess where they are based on, in part, based on whether or not they, they, they like waking up and going to school every day. And it's important that I hear from them and, you know, take a pulse every day on where they're at. Um, when I go to the open house evenings for, for one of my, for my, one of my sons, I love listening to the classes and the teachers. And I, I want, it makes me want to go back to school myself, but that's not always the case. And sometimes I will observe classrooms or even unfortunately my kids teachers and, and I'll listen. And it's unfortunate when I feel like, wow, the kids here are not engaged. They are not motivated and while boredom is a complex kind of a feeling, when boredom continues day after day, it does undermine the learning process. So that's when the classroom has to be examined to figure out how to motivate these kids, because you're right, it's the foundation of lifelong learning. And, you know, and it's funny because I think it's funny because I feel like I'm still trying to make up for my 18 years of, of pre-university schooling by 
constantly taking continuing education <laughs> courses. Um, and that's probably what motivated me to go back to school and get a few, a few more degrees afterwards. Um, so maybe it wasn't all for naught, but, uh, um, but, but yeah, so I, I think it's, it's making sure our kids are engaged and appreciate it because it is to me, and I, and I, and I don't want to keep repeating this, but learning is just such a privilege, right? When, and I'm not saying that life before 18 is easy because certainly we all have stresses and, and, and we ebb and flow at different times, but to just be able to focus on yourself and your learning, um, until you have to go out and be a responsible human being by making money is, is, is a real luxury. It, it is. And, and the way I often look at it is, you know, if you look at a, a preschool child, you know, they're naturally inquisitive, they want to learn, they're engaged in everything that's going around them. You know, you don't teach them to walk, you don't teach them to do lots of things. It happens organically at the right time in the right way based on their environment. And hopefully the, the, it's those surroundings which are very nurturing. And I often feel that the education system then just gets in the way of that natural that sort of natural progression you know there's like now we're going to do it this way because we know best and for all of those reasons that we've talked about you know and the knock-on effect of that and well-being and how uh, how all our children are developing going through it you know the statistics and and our experience often shows that like you say because of boredom because of apathy because they don't want to go to school it obviously isn't natural anymore in that new system and so I think you know even if our starting point just changes to the the understanding of this can be very natural we just need to be as the educators as the adults as the people trying to you know set an environment which is very encouraging and supportive for our children but let them almost be the guiding light with us having the experience of knowing sort of how to mold that yeah and you know in in just what you say and it's and it's hard too because something that is that I notice in Western education far more than I did in East Asian education is this notion of fun. And we have to make the learning fun versus sometimes learning isn't so fun in and of itself in that you're not maybe sitting on a bouncy seat and using colored pencils and doing um, project-based learning. And sometimes you just have to bear down and memorize stuff. Um, and And for whatever reason, I feel like you know, where I was in Asia, in Shanghai and in Tokyo, that's fine. That comes with the territory. You just have to sometimes memorize stuff. And in the U.S., I found that there's such kind of this aversion to that. And it's almost like, oh, we're hurting our children by making them, you know, study this. And I don't know how many audience, audiences I've spoken with where they think kind of rote learning is is punishment, where, you know, the research does show that the balance of project-based and rote learning and direct instruction is really the best formula because you just, you can't get away with not having to memorize certain things. That's Yeah, I love, I think that's very true. And and I think you're right. I think that word balance and, and understanding and harmony sometimes when we talk about sort of white um, work-life balance or, or sort of education and life balance and that kind of thing is the fact that it is a harmony, it is a blend and there are certain things around. And, and, and I know from myself and my own experience, you know, as a professional musician that, you know, there's great highs and there's great sort of highlights mm. of things going on in terms of great performances and working with people. But there was an awful lot of hours where it was just kind of in order to get to that stage, there are certain mm -hmm. skills, there's certain things that you have to be able to do. And that isn't so fun. That's repetition. That's understanding. Exactly. It's just doing the things that you need to do to get to where you want to. So when you get those opportunities, you're prepared and you have those skills in place. And like I say, you know, th there are lots of different ways of doing it and there's a balance to how you do it. But some of it just is you've got to do the work. That's so true. It's funny, you know, in the U.S. there's a saying, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. And I kind of feel like, what happened to that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, no, you can get to Carnegie Hall without practicing. No, you can't. Um, and, and, it's, and it's interesting to me that so much of that kind of rigor happens in our, on our sports fields, but somehow we're not really supposed to be doing that in our classrooms anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a great point, actually, in terms of, like you say, that wherever that focus happens to be in that sort of, um, yeah, sports as opposed to sort of more traditional education in academia and that kind of thing. And I know when you see certain sports people, you know, and you just know on those pressure points that they're 
they're going to kick that goal or they're going to make that pass or whatever it is. And it's only the fact they've done it that many times in the past that they're able to have the confidence and understanding that you don't know the actual result, but the percentages are fairly high because you've you've put the work in. Absolutely. And those same people have failed more probably than they've succeeded, at least initially. Absolutely. <laughs> like... But that's, you know, but that's not what we see. You know, we often just see, oh, some success, but people don't really know that, you know, that was a one out of a million opportunity or one out of 100,000 because there's just, there's, there's so much that we want to focus on that's positive, but yeah, but there, there are all these kind of failures at that, to that success. Yeah. And I think, I think, it, I think it's sharing those things, which is incredibly important. Mm hmm. Just to finish off your sort of your school experience time, were there any particular teachers you remember, and what was it about them that that sort of sort of stuck in your mind? That's another great question. Um, in thinking about that, I and I, I there's this teacher I had in first grade. I don't know, Mr. Parsons. I'll never forget him because if it was your birthday, he did a song and dance, and he was this really at least in my mind at the time, I was only six years old, so he may have been quite short. But to me, he was this huge man um, and quite portly. And and he would just come in and do this dance and he would just make you feel so special. And if you got, you know, a math question right, he would, it just, it was like he had to announce it to the class. And, and I remember at one point, the, he said, okay, we're learning about spelling. And he said, okay, whomever spells this, everything recess depends on whomever answers this uh, correctly. So he put the, um, he said, spell the word, I believe it was fantastic. And he said, if you don't spell this correctly, you're not going to recess. And I raised my hand. I was a competitive kid and I probably had no idea how to spell fantastic. And I said it and I remember saying it and, and thinking I didn't do this correctly. And he looked at me and he just said, great. And everybody went to recess because I didn't think he wanted to he wanted to punish the whole classroom and, and make me feel badly for, you know, not knowing how to spell it. And then, you know, double punishment, not letting everybody go out and having it be my fault. But there was something about him that was just so joyous and he made you want to learn. He just I mean. And of course, after that, you know, you learn from failure, even though he wrapped it up as success. I learned how to spell fantastic. That was for sure. Um, it was a great launching point for a straight. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. And, and the, the thing that it's, it's, it's a theme that I hear quite a lot is the fact that so many great teachers and so many of those great memories come from how that it made you as the student and, and the person in the class feel. Um, yeah. And, and then and you just think that's a great thing for us as adults to remember and as much as you know it's not just about the content it's the way that you deliver it but it's about the human connection and that again goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of our conversations about all sorts of things it's about the emotion it's about the connection it's about how we are as a community and as a society and I think that I think that's why those things actually have such a chord with so many people for sure who did you admire when you were young and what was it about that person that had such an impact I would answer two ways. I would say someone that I knew that I really admired, and she doesn't know this, so I should probably tell her after this, is <laughs> is my aunt. And she is my mother's younger sister by 10 years. And my mom immigrated to the U.S. Uh, and she was about 20, 26 years old when she did so from Japan. And she was like a really hardworking, tough single mom for the most part. My father passed away when I was young. He was quite ill and he passed away. And I didn't have that typical, you know, or I don't even want to say Brady Bunch because I don't think that's typical, but, you know, <laughs> a, a caregiver at home and family meals at home with siblings and or Beaver Cleaver. You know, I, I didn't have any of that. And typically when I came home, no one was home. And I did my laundry and I chipped in with the cooking, which I think is actually probably more common, right, than we give uh, credence to. But I would then in the summers go to Japan to be with my mother's younger sister and spend time with her and her family. And she was that quintessential stay-at-home mom who took care of everybody's needs in the family, um, full breakfast, you know, full dinner, grocery shopping. And she had two children and they're my youngest cousins. So they're 13 and 15 years younger than I am. And they're like my little, they're like my brother and sister. They're, they're, I call them my, my kid cousins, but they're really like my siblings. And 
just that and I and I think and the reason I say I admired her is because I think as an adult and now as a parent of three kids who are now 15, 13 and 10, I try to balance what my mom gave me and what I saw in my aunt because my aunt was around to just give me I felt like pure love. And to this day she's more the grandparent in my children's lives than any other family member. Um including the actual grandparents. So it's, she, she just gave me something that really balanced out my life and was complimentary to, to what I had. Um, and then if I was to say, and this is kind of like this crazy side of me, I was a very, very shy girl. Uh, and I thankfully, I think grew out of it, but these p- characters, these like people in, in pop culture would just influence me so much. So you know, and this is more, I, I would imagine, in, in later middle school or high school, but when Madonna came out and she was so brash and she, you know, she just did whatever she wanted and she sang about things that were, you know, you know, really like sacrilegious and, <laughs> and she did things that were just so, you know, I mean, it, especially if you're, you know, you're like a teenager, just so shocking, you know, um, and then learning about Jim Morrison and the doors and how he just didn't care about anything but what he was doing and his addictions and everything, I was like, these people live on the edge. And I was just so fascinated by it because I was such like the good girl who followed the rules and, and was supposed to do well in school. And I thought there was this whole like fringe culture. Um, But I think the bottom line for me is it helped me get out of my shyness. Yeah, it gives you a whole kind of perspective, doesn't it? Because you only know what you know. And um, yeah. and so your immediate surroundings are what you expect everybody to be like. Like you say, and I can understand, you know, earlier on you were talking about going to school and that being a very different environment and then to be sort of expi- exposed to the you know the world of, of things like Madonna and, and all of those things as well it's like where did that come from because I can't see my life going from where I am now to being like that <laughs> you know outside of it and, and and all these things that they have a big impact on us oh I mean it's it's fascinating and I'm and you know just thinking I remember when Madonna came out with I forget the name of it. I don't know if you you would know or remember, but she came out with this book that was very provocative, I think is the best way yes. to put it. <laughs> and I was in university at the time. And I think it wasn't even, it was like a special order. They couldn't sell it at bookstores because it was just so, there was just, it was rated like triple X at the time, it felt like. But having that and, you know, just knowing that that came out, it was like, well, we can do anything. Madonna did this, you know, it's kind of like there are no there are no limitations on what we can do in this belief in yourself. I think that was that was really important. And from there, what was the best piece of advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? Oh, well, this one. So like I said, my mom is a first generation immigrant and she still prides herself on, you know, 50 years on, if she doesn't understand something, she'll still say, oh, miscommunication. And you're like, no, 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 <laughs> there's no miscommunication here. You just want to play your immigrant card, you know? And so her idiomatic expressions are just like a botched bunch of vocabulary words that I think she's tried to translate or just hasn't gotten right. But something that I find myself really kind of following lately is is she told me you know Teru time to take the cookie when they pass the tray and I remember listening to her saying that when I was I don't know maybe a teenager or two and and I was thinking what is she talking like you know cookies and brownies like what is she talking about um and it just rings so true because I feel like especially with my book just having come out and getting opportunities for meeting people and networking and publicity. It's true. Sometimes you only have one shot at something. And it's really, really resonated with me more probably now than ever before, where, you know, you may have this opportunity and it's it's daunting, um, or you may not have the opportunity, but you know, you have to make that opportunity and to go after it. It's like, yeah, well, this is my maybe my one shot. And what do I really have to lose? I have to go for it. I, I, I really like that. And there was something I heard on the radio. It was this week. And it, it was it was a bunch of people chatting who are, you know, in my eyes, you know, great broadcasters and great people in their fields. They were interviewing. I think someone was on there talking about a film or a TV thing they were doing and, a, and an author. And, you know, they were like, 
but in reality all we're doing is making it up as we go along we don't actually know we're just doing one thing after the other and, <laughs> and I think that's such a great thing even even these people who are kind of you know at the top of their game in whatever field yeah, they're in they're still just yeah. thinking I'm just doing the best I can with what I've got and like you said if if, if you if you, I think it's some sort of comfort in understanding that everyone feels a bit like that so you're never going to be ready for that one great opportunity but when it comes just do it and, and just see what happens I mean, when I was in Japan, I have to say, I was an education journalist, and I had my own byline in the Japan Times. And I wrote this three piece feature on what it's like to learn English in Japan in, in the schools. And I get this, I think it was a probably an email from somebody at CNBC. And I thought, who? Why would they want to talk to me? You know, and I had no idea how TV journalism worked. And I remember being so crazy nervous that I was going to be on CNBC um, and and finally doing the interview and it got airtime. But, you know, that that after that, I was like, oh, my gosh, even if I'm completely scared to do something, um, I just have to say yes. And that, you know, and that led me to segments on CBS and NBC and Channel News Asia and CNN. So, I mean, just that one thing it was like my mom telling me time to take the cookie when they pass the tray <laughs> yeah, absolutely and that's such a great phrase isn't it it's all encapsulates all of that i can see why you love it so much <laughs> um what advice would you give your younger self now oh that's a very very good question um well it's, it's advice that i give my kids now because i feel like i didn't get this advice and i wish i had had it and that is find your people and i don't mean what people are talking about today in terms of, and I don't, again, I don't want to get this to be too political, but this whole tribalism or identity politics, I don't mean it that way. I mean, find people that will inspire you, motivate you, where you feel comfortable, who could be lifelong friends, because that social capital and networking is so important for life. Um, and, and, and lifelong friendships are just are invaluable, you know, as, as life does get more complicated and as our world becomes far more interconnected and interdependent, having friends from all over the world who see things from different perspectives is is vital. And so even when my, I, my, my oldest is applying to um, high schools right now and, you know, we, we visited, I think it was about 10, yeah, we visited 10 schools a couple weeks ago. And he, he does very, very well academically. And, and he says, well, you know, what do you think? And each time I just kept saying, you know, where do you think you will wake up every day and be happy being, you know, where are you going to be spending the least amount of time trying to fit in or finding those people that make you feel comfortable and that you can laugh with and, and who understand you so that you can focus on, you know, studying and, your activities and things that make you happy because you've already found your people. I don't want you to feel, um, you know, it's just where, you, where you're spending your time. And so that that's it. I would say find your people. I mean, and I don't say this that often, but when I was applying to university, I don't think I went to a college that really matched who I was. And I think I, while I gained a lot of life experience from that decision-making I didn't walk away with the kind of deep friendships that I feel like U.S. universities can really offer you in terms of the social capital. So I think, you know, don't don't force your, you know, circle and square peg kind of a, a you know, adage. It's it's go where where you're inspired, where your people are um, and continue to grow yourself. Yeah, I think that's that's great advice. And, and, and it's, I you can I can you can really identify with it, can't you? Because like you said. The, those people inspire you they encourage you they support you through all manner of things especially like I say if they become lifelong friends and and I think you get so much out of everything so much faster when you feel comfortable and and especially when you've got lots of options you know and, and you're able to pick and choose the places you want to go to study but also in terms of the sorts of places you want to hang out you know just do it because it, it gives you the right feeling and that's often the best way it's interesting you know we've talked a lot about sort of schools and things today um but lots of the time when people go when they first start school it's like oh they're all much of the same it's like just be in the environment you know are the kids happy do you get a warm feeling that gives you much more of an understanding of what the school is than the, than the data and and i think you'll just 
you just sort of epitomize exactly that same thing across the board. Yeah. And I, you know, because it's when you think about school, right. And in adults, we, 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 we suffer from it too. It's how are we perceived? Where do we fit in? And although hopefully we, we've kind of mastered those skills at this point, the adolescent peer influence is so strong, right? So if you're spending so much of your energy on that, which is just a natural part of development, you know, you're taking away from other parts of, of who you are and you grow so much of your self-confidence in those years or not. So it, I just feel it's so important to find your people who make you feel good, who can who can push you but support you at the same time because otherwise you're spending so much of your energy maybe feeling insecure um, and trying to fit in yeah. when you really can be developing so much of, of yourself during those years. Yeah, that's true. And one thing you just reminded me of there was something that someone said to me relatively recently was, was that the difference between understanding where you are in your life and, and certainly the adolescent time is, is a very, very sort of... Um, hyper emotional sensitive um changing in, in your development but also at the same time understanding that with that brings certain challenges and, and a certain situation but accept it for what it is in the best way you can but with that knowledge that you've just been explaining in terms of utilizing that and actually giving yourself the best way to make the most of it and i and i think understanding where you are and how it, all these things fit in but also with the knowledge that you have some choice within that as well and i i think those two things married together are a great recipe for success yeah what does your future look like Oh, another great and tough question. Um, I'm feeling relatively optimistic. My book just came out and it's doing pretty well. Um, I've met some fabulous people and I do hope to make change in our education system um, and create opportunities uh, and offer different perspectives for teachers and parents and legislators and to empower the education of, of every child Um, so it starts from what happens within your own home at the breakfast table to what's happening to those kids who may not have one, um, two parents at home who need all of the community and societal supports that we can offer them so that they, so that they have the opportunity to flourish. Because to me, again, democracy, um, only really works if every child is given a fair shake at, at an education. So the way I see myself is I, I, I love speaking to people. I'm, I'm, I'm on interviews and and being interviewed and, um, on TV and radio and podcasts and writing articles. And hopefully I can continue to write, um, and, and, and yeah, continue to, to share, to share with people what, what I learn. Yeah. Sounds fantastic and very, very exciting. (laughs) Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling very fortunate right now. And just to wrap up, what podcast book, video film song or or any resource has had the biggest impact on your life and why was that another great question um this and i don't know if it's had the biggest impact on my life overall because then i would really have to think about books that or, or films or whatever that i may have been exposed to in early elementary school but i will say that last month um here in new york city i went and saw a play called slave play are you familiar with it no i'm not actually Um, and it's one of these plays that was completely transformative. It was, and it's rare, right? When you walk into something or start a book and you leave feeling like your life values have been altered. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right within the course of, of basically two plus hours. And I went because I had an evening free and I opened up the New York times on the internet and there was an ad at the top of the page. And I went to, I just clicked on it cause it got good reviews and there was one ticket left and I go, okay, fine, I'll go. And, and all I saw actually at the time was that there were all these kind of like NC 17, you know, be careful. There's some content that may not be appropriate kind of messages everywhere. And I thought, Ooh, this is going to be juicy. You know, <laughs> I've never seen that on Broadway live. So I went and, the first, I mean, the whole the whole play, I believe, is meant to make the, the audience feel uncomfortable. But you kind of get used to that discomfort after maybe the first 20 or so minutes. And basically, the whole play is about power struggles and oppression and how we have them in our daily lives within our families, 
uh, marriages, partnerships, friendships, and how we've had them throughout our lifetimes and how they are such a formative part of our society and they are entrenched in our history from literally centuries ago and how they are almost inescapable. And what it does is it makes you kind of question all of the decisions you've made in terms of your friendships and relationships, who you've decided to partner with and how you've handled uh, specific situations based on, on, on power. And so it was, it was, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, And it was one of those plays when in, in the introduction, the, you could feel the discomfort in the audience because some people were laughing, but that kind of, I'm uncomfortable laugh. So I don't know what to do with myself. And then when there were jokes about certain races or classes of people, it was almost like, am I allowed to laugh or only those people allowed to laugh? And it just, it, it, it was just this, it was brilliant. It was, it was a magnificent, um, kind of, I guess, uh, an image or a, a play of our times, but not even what's going on today. I think it has a lot of traction today because of what's going on in our in our larger in our larger uh, world. But all the themes are, are those that have been, you know, in existence for as long as mankind has been around. Yeah, sounds wonderful. I'm gonna I'm certainly gonna do some investigating and and, and find out more information about it. Yeah, it's fascinating. So those people who are just absorbed with what you were saying want to find out more where's the best place for them to get hold of your book and to find out more about you yes please reach out to me um you can find me on social media i'm on instagram facebook twitter and linkedin and you can find me on my website teru clavel t-e-r-u-c-l-a-v-e-l at um or do, i'm sorry trueclavel.com i was going to give you my email address <laughs> <laughs> um and you can find my book on amazon it's uh, world class one mother's journey halfway around the globe in search of the best education for her children it is a very long subtitle so i'll just call it world class for short um yeah and i would love to continue having these conversations about intentional decisions we make to educate our children and i think it's it's a complicated time and i and i go into a lot of those issues um thanks so much and we'll have the the social links and the website and all of that in our show notes so um if you go to education on fire and you can click through from the show on the on the home page everyone will be able to to find all those things directly which is brilliant and, and thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your and your understanding and um and allowing us to learn from your experiences Oh, I appreciate being here. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.